in this last segment of the lecture to, quote, religious theories of religion. You could say they're Christian theories in a sociological sense, in that both of them are constructed by people who are brought up in the liberal wing of Christian theology, a wing which tends to assume some kind of religious pluralism, that all religions are equal, or at any rate that all the important ones are. But they're not religious in that they fit together with the classical teachings of the Christian tradition or any other traditional religion. The first of these is by the famous theologian Paul Tillich. He was born in Germany, but he was able to leave Germany before World War II broke out, and he ended up teaching at some top seminaries in the United States. He was really considered a big shot in post-war America, a real public intellectual as well as an existentialist philosopher, someone who could speak to the public about spiritual and religious matters, and someone who could speak to, quote, the human condition. Tillich says that religion is a matter of, quote, being grasped by an ultimate concern, end quote. But what does that mean? I'll be honest, from where I sit, Tillich's theory looks like it's full of $3 words. It sounds very learned and difficult. And I think in the end, it's itself a kind of religion, or at least the doctrinal philosophical aspect of religion or religious worldview, more than it is a theory of religions. I see Tillich as having a diagnosis and cure of his own. The diagnosis is something like this. Humans are alienated from their true selves and distracted by preliminary concerns. And the cure, he says, is absolute commitment to an ineffable ultimate concern, something one considers to be the ground of being, that which determines our being or not being. This thing, he says, may be called God, but... It could also be whatever else one takes as ultimate. Could be an experience, could be a ritual, an ethical value like love. It could be a cause, like a political or a social cause. It could be anything to which one may commit. Apparently then, one can be a naturalist and get the cure. One just has to passionately, absolutely commit to something or other. Maybe to the universe, maybe to science, again, social justice, some other cause, environmentalism. I take it this was the selling point of Tillich's philosophy, that he's offering meaning for moderns. You can have a meaningful and good life if you will just commit to something and view it as ultimate. That becomes your ultimate concern. Is it a Christian theory? Well, it's a theory by a liberal 20th century Christian. It looks like the diagnosis and cure is at odds with anything like the diagnosis and cure of a more traditional kind of Christianity. I'll be honest, I don't see much theory of religion here. It's a trivial point that religion involves commitment. Of course it does. We have to commit to something or other. If this is the right diagnosis and cure, you might well just go shopping and pick whichever religion strikes your interest, or you might pick no religion at all. Our last theorist is Smith. He was born in Toronto, Canada, and he was a minister in the Protestant United Church of Canada. His academic specialty was Islam, from 1964 to 1973, Smith taught at the Harvard Divinity School, and he was there the director of Harvard's Center for the Study of World Religions. In 73, he went back to a university in Canada and founded a department of religion there. In 1978, he returned again to Harvard. He then retired from teaching. In 1985, he became a senior research associate in the Faculty of Divinity at Trinity College in the University of Toronto. His most influential book is probably The Meaning and End of Religion. And while you don't see that cited so much anymore, one person who you see all over the media is the former Catholic nun Karen Armstrong, author of many books and frequently a talking head on documentaries, who has applied his general approach very widely. For him, religion is really about outreaching, that is, what he calls individual faith. We'll come back to that in a second. Smith objects to the general term religion and argues that this is a recent and Western concept. He points out that other traditions name themselves in unique terms. So in Buddhism, they don't say, hey, this is Buddhism, we're Buddhists. They talk about the Dharma and about the Buddha. In contrast, he says Western scholars make up names for other traditions and in so doing, misleadingly reify these phenomena. That is, make them out to be things, things with their own reality. This is from the Latin word race for thing. To reify something is to make it a thing, when in fact, it's just a concept that you're dealing with. He thinks this gives the wrong impression, for instance, that most religious Indians are somehow working within one religious system. 
soon as you slap the label Hinduism on it, that misleadingly suggests that they're all about the same thing. They all believe roughly the same thing and practice the same thing, and that just isn't true. Another case would be traditional religion in China. If you slap a label on a Chinese person and say that's a Buddhist or that's a Taoist, well, the label may fit to some extent, but they have various beliefs and practices, most Chinese people, that can be called Confucian, and other beliefs and practices that can be called Taoist, and others that seem to be Buddhist in origin. He thinks we should focus not on these abstractions, that is, words and concepts like Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, but rather on the personal faith, that is, the relationship with a higher power had by the people within those traditions. Now this is an interesting point about naming and classifying religions. It's not clear though what positive change he's suggesting. I mean, if there's a problem with our classification and our labels, why shouldn't we just come up with a better and more accurate classification and better labels? It's not like we can get rid of classifying altogether and not have labels for things and not categorize things. With regard to the Chinese example, yes, most Chinese people, at least who aren't Christians and Muslims, most Chinese people have various practices that derive from Taoism and from Confucianism and from Buddhism. The solution, though, is not to refuse to label people. Other scholars have, in fact, coined the term Chinese traditional religion to refer to that uniquely Chinese blend of those three traditions. And when it comes to very broad umbrella terms like Hinduism, you can just give more information. You can distinguish Vishnu devotees from Shiva devotees and, and both of those from worshippers of the goddess. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't think that denigrates individuals or that it needs to lead to misunderstanding. We have to have general concepts to understand this vast field of human experience. What really bugged Smith about these classifications was that he thought they divided people and impeded sympathy. I don't see why it has to do either one of those. If someone classifies you as a Roman Catholic Christian, why does that make them unsympathetic? Maybe they like Catholicism. Does it divide you from your neighbor? Well, yeah, in people's minds, I guess if your neighbor's an atheist, that divides you from them, but why is that a bad thing? Someone wants to understand you and your neighbor, they ought to understand your religious views and your neighbor's religious views or lack of religious views. That's not dividing people in a bad sense, that's just understanding reality. That is, understanding how people look at the world and how people live in the world. Smith hoped that analyzing religions and comparing them one to the other would lead to an appreciation of a common faith which is shared among all the traditions. So if you took an individual Buddhist, an individual Christian, an individual Muslim, you'd find a common faith. Now, it's not clear what that's supposed to mean. Common experience? It's not clear there is any one experience which you find in all the world religions. Does he mean that it's a common belief? It'd be hard to find something like that common object of experience, like they're all interacting with the same thing. Some people have theorized along those lines. Common values. Really, why should we assume that there is anything which is shared across the board? That there is anything in common between all religious people? I don't think Smith was too clear about what he meant by faith. As best I can tell, it's supposed to be something like this. The human capacity to find meaning, that is, value, in something transcendent, something beyond. Is that the common faith? Well, I think that capacity is in human beings. I'm not sure you would always call it a faith. I think a lot of atheists would say they can find meaning in something beyond, something greater than themselves, such as the physical universe. But Smith hoped to develop what he called a world theology, some kind of understanding of the divine that would naturally arise out of the various religions and somehow mesh together. It's hard to imagine what that could possibly be. They have different diagnoses and cures, and they recommend different ways of life, and they hold up different examples for people to follow. Examples such that one can't follow all of them. Teachings such that, to be self-consistent, one can't believe all of them. It's fair to say that the program of world theology hasn't gotten very far. Before you end this lecture, back to my distinction between three kinds of religious theories. In this lecture, we've seen theories that assume the truth of naturalism and then come along and say, yeah, religion, it's just this, the product of wishful thinking or a tool for those in charge to manipulate the masses. And then there are theories that I say are not naturalistic. They seem to assume there is something out there 
there is something to religion. It's not pure illusion. And yet they don't commit to and arguably aren't consistent with any actual religion. But you could say they're religion friendly. What we haven't seen are theories in my second category, which don't assume naturalism and are clearly compatible with at least one actual religion. Such theories like that are rare. And in fact, they're more often taught in theology than in religious studies. These would be in the, in the Christian context called theology of religions. And they get involved in more questions than we're going to get into in this class. Why are these theories rare? Well, they're not going to be promoted in the secular academy because they're too committed to one of the religions. They're typically not part of a religion's ordinary teaching. They're not something you get in Sunday school in Christianity, for instance. They're too abstract. A theory like this would be too broad in its subject matter, too difficult to easily convey outside of an academic context. As far as I've seen, the most highly developed theories like this are Christian and tend to be from the liberal or modernist wing of Christianity. Not always, though. I have also seen some such theories from Islamic quarters. But in this lecture, I focused on theories in the first and third types because those are the kind that you really encounter in the field of religious studies today. In our next lecture, the second biggest religion in the world.